Thank you so much. Um, and yep, you got the zone right. Very often some people say dazen or dazen, as my father calls it. Um, but yeah, the zone, the zone. So thanks, thanks. Good for being here. I think, uh, I think I was at Agile Roundabout this time last year, or maybe, yeah, sometime around this time last year. So um, I'm very humbled and honored that you guys invited me back so you can endure more punishment. <laughs> um, so yeah, just a quick little thing um, about me. Uh, so my name is Jonathan Lucky. Yep, my last name is Lucky. Uh, that is my surname. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm from the United States. I grew up in a little city, um, actually a big city called Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, so uh, find it on a map. It's a it's an interesting place where it is. Uh, for the last 10 years, I've been working in both business to business and business to consumer software. Um, I've been involved in a wide variety of roles ranging from sales um, to marketing, product marketing, um, product management. Um, and in my current iteration of my life, I am an agile coach. So um, very exciting stuff over the years. And about two years ago, uh, I, I've been with the zone for about five years. Um, I transferred here about two years ago uh, from our offices in Charlotte. Um, a quick thing about the zone, if you don't know what the zone is, it's um, we are a live sports streaming platform um, where we stream a variety of live sports all over the world. Um, so we're in several countries around the world right now, including Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Spain, Brazil, United States, Canada, Japan, so forth. Um, and our goal is later on this year, we'll be launching globally. So um, don't be surprised if you start seeing uh, the zone or, or you start watching the zone locally here in the UK. So very exciting to work in sports um, and we're very excited to see sports coming back safely um, this year or relatively soon. All right, um, so let's jump right in. Um, one of the things is we're talking about um, uh, the theme of tonight being agnostic agile, and you're probably doing it already. Um, uh, one of the things that got me thinking about um, is about when we often think about framework or think about agile, we're thinking about the practices, so the frameworks. Scrum, Kanban, XP, Programmer Anarchy, safe, nexus, scrum at scale, whatever. And um, one of the things I got to think about as I was preparing this presentation is that in reality, um, we could follow every single rule in all of these frameworks. We could enforce every single practice. We could have um, the best daily standups. We could have the best uh, uh, sprint planning meetings. We could have a really cool looking, well-grained backlog. Um, we could have the very best cycle times. We could be increasing our velocity uh, 100% sprint over sprint. We could be hitting every single deadline, every date, exceed all of our OKRs, objectives and key results, uh, for those of you who don't know what those are, um, beat every, AK, uh, every KPI, meet every standard, and yet still fail to generate frequent value to the customer in a creative, collaborative environment. Um, so that's not to say that the stuff above um, is not important. Uh, I have meetings about this stuff all the time, but we always have to maintain a perspective that this stuff, all of the, the frameworks and the rules and all that stuff, all those things are supposed to serve our primary objective, which is generating value frequently to the customer. And how do we how do we sustain generating that value frequently to the customer? It's through having a creative collaborative environment. And so that's really, really key. Um, sometimes we get really caught up in the processes and the procedures and stuff. Um, we're really we need to have our eye on the ball, which is generating that value to the customer. So I figured I'd share um, three stories in my experience in software development across my career. Um, that my kind that in, at least for me gave me a glimpse of uh, what like that really core bit of what agility is about, you know, not just following scrum exactly, not just um, doing having nice continuous flow on a Kanban board, but really that, yeah, we're really hitting that core of what agility is meant for to to um, a team and to a business. 
Um, so the first story I want to talk about is from a story uh, very from very early in my agile journey. And I and in this time I worked for a company that was um, a business intelligence um, and uh, reporting um, uh, software company, so enterprise software. And uh, for much of the time there, the way we built software, we, we, we really believed we were an agile company um, where some companies are on one end of the extreme where they have all they have every single bit of agile bureaucracy that you can think of from ever having like really, really like every single kind of meeting refinements, pre refinements and three amigos and two amigos and release trains and all this stuff. Um, we were actually on the other end of the extreme where we said well, we're agile. So we don't have, we're not gonna have meetings, even though we're having a meeting in this video later on. This is when we started doing, do, be working on our agile transformation. We said, oh, we're agile. We, we're not gonna have meetings. Um, oh, you know, we're not supposed to bother developers. So we'll just give the developers, you know, this vague thing, and then we'll just kind of let them run with it for six months. And then we'll come back and see what they came up with. Um, and that's what we thought um, agility was. And, and, we, and we weren't getting the results as a business that we wanted. The engineers weren't happy. Um, and we said, you know, we need to make a change. And so we um, had had a, a quote unquote proper agile transformation. Um, we decided to do Scrum. And uh, but we wanted to approach Scrum a little different from uh, how uh, everyone traditionally performs Scrum. And we all do this. My teams do this even today. Um, your, does your sprint planning go a little bit like this? You look at what the tickets that are at the top of your backlog, you guys go, okay, what do we need to get done? You drag in the tickets into the sprint and JIRA and you go, okay, guys, is this too much work? Can we handle this? What else do we got to get done? All right, are we happy with all the work that's in the sprint? Is everybody busy? Does everybody have something to work on? You know, that's kind of how, you know, you that's how sprint planning works, right? And then everybody nods and you get hit, click start. And then go, off you go on your sprint. The engineers pick their little, pick their individual tasks right out of the board and then off they go to do their work. Um, we wanted to approach it differently um, from that. So what we did is we said, we're going to just pick one user story from the top of our backlog, just one user story. And the entire team is going to focus and work on that one user story for the sprint. That's it, just one, just one user story for the sprint. Um, and what we did is we said, instead of saying, let's try and get all of the checklists done that's in the acceptance criteria of our user story, we said, well, we want to look at that user story and say, what is the smallest version of that story we could potentially deliver within two weeks? Um, I think in this case, I think we ran two and a half week sprints. Um, so we did that. And then the team worked on just that story together all day long. So in some cases, they mobbed. They did some mob and pair programming on those things. In other cases, they kind of broke down broke down aspects of that story. And they said, hey, I'll, do, I'll take the data layer. OK, cool. I'll work on the styling, whatever. By the end of the sprint, we also approached the sprint review differently um, from what a lot of companies do. So a lot of companies. Typically, you review your sprint review ends up being a demo to your product owner, uh, um, or it tends to be a demo to stakeholders, um, and that's usually what we always do because the customer is not necessarily available. Um, what we did is we said, actually, let's bring a customer into our sprint reviews. So our sprint reviews were to were with the customer, and what we did is we said that we took that one story we worked on which in this case was schedule a crystal report automatically via email. And we said, um, hey user, what we'd like you to do with this tool is to schedule a crystal report automatically with an email. Now here's where the magic happened. This was where it got really exciting. So we, crowd, so all, we crowded together. When I say we, um, the, the, the developers, the designers, um, the people in product, uh, even stakeholders, architects, whatever, we all, crowded around the monitor because the user was on a WebEx um, and we watched the user use what we just built. So now this isn't doing this user testing sometimes six months, uh, this review six months after you've built the thing, like we just built it, we just finished it and we brought the user in 
to give it a try. And immediately the magic happened where individually the developers started noticing something was wrong. Hmm, hmm, that's not right. Or hmm, maybe we need to change that. And then the designer said, hmm, you know, the, the, the styling is not right there. Hmm, on this break point, it's not where it needs to be. Um, and then even the stakeholders who were observing it went, ah, the user finds that valuable. Hmm, I wonder how we can sell that. So it created a, a whole interesting conversation. And at the end of the review uh, in observing the user use it, we gathered feedback from the user and we also took our notes and we compared it all together. And that was our sprint review. And then we said, well, based off of that, and in this case, uh, what we found was that we gave that user the task, which was to schedule a crystal report by email. Um, we realized that the user kind of got lost in certain areas. So we said, well, how do we, how do we help the user not get lost? And so then we said, that's gonna be the topic of our next sprint. So instead of saying, okay, we built the thing, okay, off to the next user story in the backlog. No, we said, okay, let's iterate, let's improve on what we've just done. So we um, then took that work and we said, well, what if we created a, a um, checklist? And uh, with that checklist, we will, that might help the user guide him uh, through, through the process. So that was our next sprint, we built the checklist. So the next re sprint review was um, we brought another user in and we said, we asked them the same question, except now the checklist is there. And uh, the user went through and they saw the checklist and then they start, we started noticing that the user would use the checklist as a guide, but they wouldn't know necessarily where the button was. So we said, okay, great. So now again, we said, well, how do we make sure that the user knows where the button is? And that was the user story. And that would be our next user story. So then we said, uh, what if when the user hovers their mouse over the check over the checklist item, it highlights the button on the screen? And uh, that was our next user story. And we built that in another sprint. And then we went that and we brought that to our next sprint review. The user, another user came in, we asked them the same question, schedule a crystal report by email. And the user did it, they, without any trouble. They went through the steps, they followed the checklist, they knew where the buttons were. And then after they tried it a few times, they knew exactly what to do. It was baked in their missile, into their uh, muscle memory. And that was it, voila, we got there, you know? And we got there in just a couple of sprints and we got something that works and works incredibly well. And then we moved on to the next story at the top of the backlog. So that's really powerful. Um, very often we tend to just go down this long path of building this thing, even when we're working in, 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 in quote unquote agile, but we don't necessarily do that important bit, which is really evaluate is, is the thing we're building, is it actually solving the user problem and, and answering that question as soon as possible. So the next story I'll share, is uh, when I worked with a website called Sporting News, which is also a part of the zone um, uh, some years back uh, while I was still living in the United States. And uh, it's a sports media website where we have all kinds of sports news and sports content, right? So um, one of the things we found was we got very weary of what I'd like to call the backlog schlep. Um, where you're just going through ticket after ticket after ticket after ticket in the backlog. And um, we realized that, yeah, we're delivering and yeah, we're delivering a lot of software, but it was beginning to feel like we're just churning out lots of code, right? So we said, well, let's take a break from that. Um, not saying that doing that is necessarily inherently wrong, but we, we wanted to take a break from that um, to actually try and let's see if we can solve a problem solve some sort of new problem. So what we did is we created a one week sprint and we based this one week sprint on a book called Sprint by Jake Knapp. Um, definitely a book I would most certainly recommend uh, you all read and give a try. Um, and uh, what we said is we're going to pull all the right people in the room, all the right people, um, not just the developers, the designers who all exist in, in disparate departments in this case, um, developers, designers, uh, you know, the product people, um, and we even had executive level stakeholders, you know, VPs, EVPs, and we all gathered together in the same room. And like, as you see in these pictures here, and we wanted to not spend the next six months doing upfront requirements analysis and architecture and all these other things. We didn't want to do that. We wanted to say, we wanted to identify a key problem that executive stakeholders were really frustrated with 
and said, we want to spend a week and try to really give solving that problem that they're experiencing or that that need that they have a shot. And it was awesome. The first on day one, the executives really talked about the things that they really wanted and what they needed. And we really kind of tied that into the product about what we what we could potentially do. And fo again, following um, Jake Knapp's um, book, everyone kind of did a little bit of a design clinic where we uh, came and sketched up a bunch of ideas. That's one of the pictures that you see there now. And everybody participated in this. So the engineers participated, the execs pr uh, participated, the product, the designers, everybody. And we ended up coming up with an idea that we all really, really liked that worked really, really, that we thought could be really work really well, that we could potentially build within a very, very short amount of time. And so we did that. And we built a working feature, though very bare bones, within a week. When I say bare bones, there was boilerplate. Um, some stuff just had basic styling. Um, there were all kinds of things that, uh, you know, it was a little bit janky here and there. There might have been some mistakes. There were definitely some bugs. But that didn't matter. We just wanted to get this thing built in a matter of a couple of days so we could hurry up and validate whether this would work or not. Instead of spending months and months and months and months and months and months doing all of these meetings, trying to trying to plan out whether we think it might work or not, we just built it, and we uh, reviewed it at the end of the week. Everyone loved it. Um, the user we tested it on, we just kind of did a hallway test with some people that weren't involved in it, and it worked really well. And so then we turned to the executives who were involved this entire week because they sat there right with us. We said, "Hey." Is this something that you want to continue? Um, should we should we try to productionize this? And they said, yeah, this is great. So we didn't even have to go back and try and spend the extra time and energy trying to sell it to executive leadership because they were already involved. They were already there. And part of that, of that thing was their idea anyway. And it was directly connected to a specific pain that the executives really wanted to see resolved. And so they said, yeah. So we ran uh, just two traditional sprints to productionize it. And it currently is a live feature on Sporting News even today. In fact, I believe it's also on, the, um, on some editions of NBA.com as well. And that was, was powerful. We created a brand new feature that we, that we didn't spend six months trying to figure out within just a couple of weeks. And we immediately reaped the value out of it right then and there. The final story I'll share with you guys uh, is um, something way more recent. And this is with uh, one of my current teams here in London um, in the zone. Um, and this is the, in case you're wondering, the video playback team. Um, so they're the people, we're the team that builds the, the player, uh, the thing you see when you're watching the game. So pretty important. Um, and one of the things with this team they said, guys, they, they came to me and they're a very mature team. They had been running Scrum long before I had joined them as, as their Scrum master. Um, and they, they said, you know, Lucky, we're, we're really tired of Scrum. You know, um, the meetings, uh, they, they kind of they suck. The way how we're doing the tickets and refinements and this, that, and the other story points, they're killing us, all that kind of stuff. And they just got really weary. Of, of doing that and they wanted to go to Kanban. And you've probably had this happen where um, your teams or you yourself go, we're so tired of all this overhead. Let's just go to Kanban. Everything will be easier if we just do that. And so I said, you know, let, you know, fine, let's just go to Kanban. Let's just do that. So we did. And we stripped away everything. So we stopped having refinement because we said, we'll just refine as we go. We stopped having planning because we said, we'll just plan as we go. We don't need to have that meeting. Um, we stripped all of that, all of our normal overhead and framework and process away when we were doing Kanban. But an interesting thing that happened there was that the same underlying things that the team was extremely, extremely frustrated about still remained. Um, so that means that it wasn't Scrum that was the source of the team's frustration. And it wasn't Kanban that was going to magically make the team feel better either, because those are just tools that merely um, that merely reveal your challenges. You really it doesn't really matter what kind of framework you're using, even when you're talking about at scale in an organization of having 
30, 40, 50 teams across your uh, enterprise. If you don't address the underlying problems and challenges that your team or your collection of teams are encountering, it doesn't matter how well you optimize their process. It doesn't matter how well you run your scrum. It doesn't matter how fast your engineers can type. If they, if you don't address the underlying problems that the team has, um, you're not going to get any better than you already are. So um, at some point at the beginning of this year, the team approached me and said, hey, Lucky, you know, we think we want to go back to Scrum. That's not my idea. Now, I never suggested to them to go back to Scrum. This was entirely the team's idea. And no, this is not me championing Scrum or putting down Kanban or anything like that. The team said, you know what, we want to use Scrum, but we want to use Scrum to make sure we reinforce certain practices um, and use it as a tool to reinforce certain practices. And that was really key. And the team voted unanimously to return to Scrum, but with new features. So we iterated on our process, our frameworks, just like you would software. Um, and we said, okay, well, well, here are the problems that we used to have. How can we use different things in Scrum to make those problems not exist? And so we did that. And um, we made sure that the meetings ran better. We made sure that the teamwork was a lot tighter. We made sure we held the engineers to the right level of accountability, but we also made sure we held the business to the right levels of accountability. Um, and so we used Scrum as a tool to give us the outcomes that we wanted. And we've been doing this for the last six months now, and the team has generally been pretty happy with it and a lot of the transparency and the things that it created. Um, will the team want to change this? Yeah, they may come back and say, hey, Lucky, we want to go back to Kanban for X amount of reasons. But before it wasn't just, we don't feel like doing refinement, so let's do, or doing sprint planning, so let's do, let's do Kanban instead. It's, we're going to switch frameworks because this framework is the best framework for this outcome or this practice that we want to reinforce. And they will likely change it again. And that's okay. We will likely modify it some more. And that's okay. Take the, take the core of what something is and then just slowly layer on what you think is useful and is going to work for you. Okay, so to wrap up with some tips, um, mix and match. Um, don't be afraid to mix things together. And you're probably already doing that. Very often we find um, people already mix Scrum and Kanban together already. Very often people mix things, mix Scrum and extreme programming together. Um, but also try to find more exotic mixes like um, Scrum and uh, Programmer Anarchy or mix in uh, Jake Knapp's Sprint model into there or maybe come up with your own framework. It doesn't matter. It just has to work towards your primary goal, which is just generating that or that value um, frequently for the customer. Whatever practice you decide to pick. Just learn it and practice it well enough so that when you decide to deviate from it, you know why, you know exactly why you're deviating from it. Um, so that's really key. It's not about just abandoning it because you just don't feel like doing it. You're doing it because there's a very specific reason and it's giving you something by deviating from it. Um, and the same thing with your, your, again, going by modifying for the right reasons, same thing. It needs to reinforce the outcome that you want. If there's a rule or a pattern or a practice or something that is not reinforcing the primary uh, objective, which is frequently generating value, then maybe it needs to change. Beware of extremes. Balance is key. Um, if you, you don't want to be too authoritarian and have too much process, but um, you also don't want to have zero process or zero things. And, you know, having too many meetings is a problem, but have, not having any meetings at all is also another serious problem. And when in doubt, just let the Agile Manifesto just be your guide. Um, if you're following the four lines of the manifesto, if you're aligned with the 12 principles as well, you're probably going to be okay, even if you're not following something perfectly. Let that be your guide and follow it. And just remember, just keep your eye on the prize, which is the most important part, is generating frequent value to the customer, right? If that's not happening then you need to reevaluate your entire delivery model at a team level, at an organization level. If that's not happening, you need to reevaluate that. And you need to, and how do you sustain that? 
is having a creative collaborative environment. So if you don't have a creative collaborative environment, any frequent value that you're trying to generate is not going to last very long. So uh, I thank you all very much. I hope you've found these experiences useful. Um, and uh, I guess at this point, I, we'll have questions, right? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. And um, by the way, um, Rob and Nick, if you want to jump in or ask any questions, um, then feel free. So the first question was from Prem Kumar. Um, it's two questions. So firstly, what was your team's velocity? Um, the next question was, what technique did you use to prioritize items from the backlog? Ooh, good questions. And I'm assuming Velocity was probably talking about my first example with, um, with the team where we only worked on that one story at a time. So our first Velocity for our first two sprint, couple of sprints was like one, uh, one ticket, one user story. <laughs> and in that particular case, how we did estimation, because estimating and Velocity sometimes go hand in hand. We did an initial um, story points estimate across all of the major user stories we wanted to do. So it was like 20 or 30 of them. Um, and then we didn't really worry about points after that because they have served their purpose. We did an estimate and every once in a while we would reevaluate. Um, but in terms of velocity, for the first few sprints, it was literally one story. But as we kept going, we got better, right? So we got better at delivering one story. And so then we started being able to say, okay, we can do, if we were able to deliver one story, and we were able to get that done within the first two days of the sprint. We didn't, of course, sit on our thumbs. We went, we were then said, okay, we're a little bit more confident now. We can pick the next story at the top of the backlog and work on that together. But only after the first one is 100 is done, right? So um, that's how we scaled our velocity is as we got better, and as we got better at solving the user's problems, we got more confident at completing a story early in the early enough in the sprint to be able to start a new start on a new story in the sprint. Again, that's not necessarily 100% Scrum compatible, but we found it was very effective at us managing what we could handle. Um, and every single time, we always had not just a working a working story at the end of your sprint. We had of working product at the end of every sprint, which was very powerful for us. Okay, I've got another question from Adam. Um, he said, how do you get buying from management? Frequently, I've seen that um, the immediate team are able to change, but the management layers both struggle to accept the change will add value. Uh, for me, I find that the only way to get the buy-in is to get them to see the results of it because if you you could come up with all kinds of proposals and data and stuff um and and the optimist in me would like to say yes yeah, stakeholders would buy into that but in my experience um you usually have to give your your stakeholders something to point to and so you got to create a success story sometimes that involves asking for forgiveness rather than permission and say hey we just went ahead and did this and look see what we got you out of that we can do more of that. So sometimes you just gotta just do and just do it and, um, and, then, and then let it be successful. And then now you have something to point to, um, to your stakeholders to say, hey, if we do more of this, you're gonna get more of what you want. Uh, next question is from Vivek. Um, they mentioned in the third example, what was the underlying issue that was finally addressed when you went back to Scrum? Yeah. Oh, man. Whew. There were quite a few underlying issues. <laughs> um, well, mainly um, it was it had to do with a making sure we one of the biggest things for us was prioritization. And actually, that was, I think, the second part of someone else's question. So that actually reminds me to answer the two together. Um, prioritization was one of the fundamental issues because. Um, many, many companies like the zone, we're growing very fast. We want to be able to do a lot of things and do a lot of things fast. But guess what happens is the magic word, the magic sentence happens when you say, oh, what's, what's the most important thing? And someone replies, everything is important. So we started, so we had to address that by A, making sure we really empowered the product owner um, to be able to make decisions about what comes first and what comes next. And the second thing that we did is we, we, we regularly had these, um, I guess you could say seminars or workshops where we laid out all the big programs of work. 
we brought in all the stakeholders together and we almost kind of did a poker game to decide um, what, what was more important than the other. And we always emerged out with an actual prioritized list. The final thing is, is again, kind of getting sponsorship for saying, let's work in this better way. Is we said, okay, guys, let us work on just this first thing, this first program, and let us deliver it. Um, and then you'll see that we'll get that one program done faster than if we were to try to work on all 15 programs simultaneously. And, and they let us do that. And they saw the results of that and it, and it worked very well. So that's how we addressed, that was one of the underlying issues we had. We had others even just kind of inside the team. But yeah, you gotta address those kind of issues and Scrum, Kanban, none of that stuff's gonna save you from those types of challenges. 